So, this will be part three of the mid-season finale. Mid-season episode, whatever you actually want to call it. Um, where this part, I basically come to terms with where I ideologically stand and my views on kind of things about this. This is the one where I have said and do strongly believe will be the most controversial and will draw me the most ire. So, especially from my fellow Marxists, who will most likely make generalizations and other things from me, and people that will probably try to uns that will unsubscribe, make statements about me, etc. But essentially, this is where I kind of think things are going. So let me first kind of explain myself. I've been having conversations with friends of mine and kind of talking it through, thinking it through personally, and especially even concerning the things that Jason Unruh has said and other people have said and stuff like that. And do it, and while I utmost agree with them on a lot of things, particularly the, the fact that social democracy and reformism is not revolutionary, and that reforms and bourgeois parliamentarianism doesn't achieve revolution, we also have to come to the realization that in the first world, revolution does not seem to be a viable option. It does not even seem like it is hardly existent. If, in fact, for the most part, it's non-existent at, at any rate you put it. Because in the first world, people have benefited too much off of imperialism, and they've benefited too much off of, you know, the, essentially off of the exploitation of the third world. That being said, it, there's going to, we've reached this point where we have to realize that there's going to be this, essentially the showdown that between social democracy in the West and revolutionary potential in the third world. Now, what do I mean by that? I think as Marxists, we need to come to the realization that as far as revolutionary potential in the first world, that we are not, that we can continue to strive for it, we can continue to believe what we believe, but the idea that we are going to have revolution in the first world just does not seem, seem very realistic. There's very little, if any, revolutionary potential in the first world. And we're most likely not going to see that occur within our lifetime. In fact, you know, if we do, it's going to be a very, very, very long time. So, essentially where I got to in this is that I believe that it's time for us to kind of update our views to the present. And that's kind of what Jason's gotten at and a lot of other people have gotten at, and I truly do believe is... We need to update our views because the Marxist viewpoint that we've had, the Marxist Leninist, even MLM and MLM Ho Chi Minh thought, everything else that's come along since then, we need to really modify and come to terms with to the globalization and the idea of where we stand as far as Marxism now and where essentially things are going. Now, I know that Jason Unruh is staunchly opposed to Bernie Sanders because, and to a large extent I agree with him because Bernie Sanders is an imperialist and basically wants to continue to keep 5,500 people in Afghanistan on imperialist bases and he wants to keep, you know, and he essentially is very imperialistic when it comes to the Iran, um, well, Iran, Palestine, or Iran, Israel, and the Israel Palestine sort of situation in which he supports Israel. Not surprising because he is, you know, he is at the very least ethnically Jewish, though I believe religiously he's agnostic or atheist, but he's never going to admit that. And personally, I think he is, you know, he is ethnically Jewish. And so I understand his, his standpoint. Now, um, but much like how Jason was when it came down to voting for um, 
the NDP and um, and certain people um, in in Canada. I personally believe that he misunderstands where we stand in America. It's not that some of us that are Marxists are being f completely first worldist or completely ignoring the idea of Bernie Sanders imperialism, nor ignoring the fact of his bourgeois liberal and social democratic, you know, standing. It's the fact that tactically much like the NDP and everything else, that tactically voting for Bernie Sanders is the best alternative when you consider the other alternative there. And I don't necessarily believe in the idea of sabotaging one's country in order to achieve revolution, though it is a viable alternative. Because the viable alternative of sabotaging one's country means us resorting to fascism. And if we have to resort to some sort of, like, kinesiist, th this kinesiism sort of neoliberal mentality to keep fascism out of power, then I'm going to choose the social democrat over the fascist. I mean, our primary objective is to keep fighting against fascism and keep fascism from ever coming to power. And that's where I personally believe this is at. Donald Trump is a third positionist, and if you look at any other person other than Donald Trump, they're even more third positionist, Nazi-esque, or fascist as it comes down to it. But either way you slice it, the American right is a fascist organization of people. It's a fascist collective. Hillary Clinton represents bourgeois liberal interests. She represents this moderate, if not developing, neoconservative ideal idealism that's building within the Democratic Party. Whereas Bernie Sanders and his supporters and the splinters of people from the Democratic Party that support him and the Green Party even too, he represents basically the new neoliberal movement, which America needs. Yes, does America need revolution? Does the first world itself need revolution? Desperately, the answer would be yes. But since that doesn't appear that that's going to happen, it seems logical to vote tactically for the person that at least will... that is not a fascist. That's not to say that Bernie Sanders doesn't, that doesn't exhibit or can't exhibit when he gets there forms of reactionary sentiment. In fact, in some cases we can say yes, he does exhibit reactionary sentiment. But voting for him would be a tactical vote against fascism. And while I'm not necessarily advocating that people vote for him, voting this year in the U.S. election means more than it ever should be to Americans and to the first world itself. Because it's voting voting for Bernie Sanders, yes. D does that mean that we're still voting for imperialism? Yes. Does that mean we're still voting for bourgeois parliamentarianism? Yes. There's no denying that. But voting for him is a tactical vote against fascism and keeps people like Donald Trump and his xenophobia, the Islamophobia, out of political office. Now, does it really change the concept of Congress? No. And for those of you that have congressional elections coming up this year, please vote for the viable alternative, because keeping what is currently in office in Congress is not a very good option. And when it comes down to Congress, I would be preferable. It would be preferable to vote your current representative out if we're going to vote at all this year. But essentially, that's where I'm trying to get to, because social democracy does not achieve revolution. That's a fact. We acknowledge that. But social democracy is the closest that it seems like we're going to get right now in the West and in the First World. So, logically, it seems like getting that and getting the reforms that we want is the best option that someone in my position has in the first world because I'm not going to just up and move to the third world 
anytime soon because in order to do I mean preferably I'd love to go live in Venezuela but <laughs> I don't have the means to do so at this current time though I do try to help the third world in any way I can so essentially what I'm saying is social democracy in the first world is as close as we're going to get and is at least a step towards changing the minds of people and trying to change the mindset of certain people so that possibly they open up to the idea of start to transition towards an toward not transition but at least start to think towards a mentality of hmm maybe revolutionary social we're not getting what we truly want out of social democracy maybe we can actually you know maybe it's time we actually finally do something about that and actually you know maybe one day get people to say you know what fuck all this revolution let's take arms against the state and form the workers state i'm not saying that's all i'm not necessarily saying that's also a realistic approach but at least it gets you somewhere some will call this a reactionary counter-revolutionary statement but if you look at it in terms of the first world social democracy seems to be the best alternative and the the only the it seems to be the really closest we're going to get to any form of I can't even say revolution to, to get to any form that, that will be beneficial or close to what we represent is what I'm trying to say it's the closest to what we can represent because essentially there is no revolutionary potential in the first world there isn't and personally it's just for me I think that right now that's the route we need to achieve that does not mean let's throw you know just throw everything out I'm not saying that I'm turning towards social democracy because I'm not because personally I believe at the same time if we can build some sort of education towards people and get rid of this anti-capitalist anti-socialist stance that the West and particularly Americans have maybe we can begin to turn the tide over time and in you know, few generations down the line you know, actually start educating people what, on what communism and socialism really is, instead of saying, you know, making baseless assertions and other quackery that goes on about it from the right. Um, at the same time, while we do that, let us focus on building the revolutionary potential and fighting for the third world and building the worker states there and building the worker states that, and building towards a communist sort of thing in the third world supporting communist still supporting the communist regimes and stuff like that supporting revolutionary fighters freedom fighters in the third world you know actually donating or actually sending money or do even if you can have the means go to the third world and help those in some way whether it's some freak humanitarian sort of you know venture or whether you actually go there to take up arms and help fight with these people one you know it doesn't really matter but essentially helping the third world achieve revolution while trying to get as close as we can towards that over time in the first world so essentially what I'm advocating is that there's nothing wrong with remaining a communist and trying to get reforms in the first world while supporting communism in the third world. Is it contradict contradictory and sounds hypocritical? Yes. But if we can achieve some sort of leverage in the first world, maybe there was a way that we can change the mindset to push people further towards the left. It's a freak idea. Who knows? This is why I say that this might piss a few people off, but it needed to be said, and I hope people understand where I'm coming from. I'm NorCal Nick, leader of the revolutionist movement, and this has been NorCal Corner.